Burgos Hi. back again so soon. <laughs> yeah. It's lovely seeing you again. And uh, I got to say, I'm quite pleased with the outcome here. I saw Kinds of Kindness at the Cannes Film Festival at its world premiere. What a blast. What what a time. It was, it, it, it was in many ways, what people were saying was a bit of like a return to form almost. Not to say that anything had necessarily changed so much over the last couple of years. You're still you. But it was great to reunite with your writing partner again and get some more of the type of style that some of your earlier work uh, really reminded us of. And so congratulations on the reception of the film, first and foremost, winner of the Best Actor Prize at Cannes. How are you feeling, uh, first of all, just coming off of everything from Poor Things and now straight into this? Are you like in need of a break? How, how are you doing right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm. I will eventually take a break. I'm. I'm starting to feel like I need it. Uh, <laughs> and you know, every time that I finish something, I, I never can, you know, stay still for too much. I, you know, there's always something in my mind, and I'm like, oh, I'm wasting time. Why am I not doing that? Which is how kinds of kindness came to be uh, that quickly, right after poor things, because we ended up shooting it during uh, VFX post-production of Poor Things, I just felt that I wasn't doing enough uh, following VFX. And since we had just finished this other script, I thought it was a good idea to go and shoot it. Well, I got to say, three separate stories, all of them dealing with seeking love, adoration, and the limits that they will go to in order to get it. Um what limits made me question what would I do <laughs> for that? And I'm curious to know for you personally, what what is the craziest thing you've ever done for the love uh, and adoration from somebody else? I mean, I don't know, probably crazy things that I don't even want to remember. Uh, but I mean, yeah, that's the the whole uh, point of, you know, creating, creating those kind of uh uh, situations in order to observe uh, mm -hmm. and you know take things uh, to extremes and see you know how each individual person that sees that uh, feels like uh, as you say you know put yourself in their places and try and imagine uh, how it would be for you or what your uh, judgment is on other people's decisions uh, life decisions. Uh, I think it's you know it's a very interesting uh, arena to to observe. I think so too. The uh, the limits of human behavior, especially, are quite fascinating to say the least. Um, because these are three separate stories. Did you shoot them um, basically one at a time, or were they all out of order during the shooting schedule? No, we shoot them one at a time. Well, first of all, there's the practicality of the because the same actors are playing a different character in its story. We they needed to slightly change their appearances, cut their hair, or dye them, or whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of uh, you know guided us guided us to uh, filming the three stories, you know, one after the other. But which is in any case very beneficial for every other aspect of filmmaking. Like the actors can. You know, follow what it is that they're doing. I can, I can understand more how the the filming is progressing, and I think it's beneficial for everyone to be filming uh, things in sequence as much as it is possible. Absolutely, your friend uh, Yorgos uh, Stephanakos uh, plays RMF in this movie, and the title RMF is included in all three of the stories. Is that just? an in joke between you and him <laughs> uh, like how how did that all come to be <laughs> well that's a quite a long story actually because um we, we when we started writing uh, we started writing the one story mm -hmm. uh, so rmf was that part of that story the way he still is uh, and then when we decided that we want to make uh, a film with a different form and structure and include more than one stories uh, we didn't want, you know, the characters to 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 be in, in all of the stories, but we wanted like one of them to be the point of reference in its three stories. So we chose 
we chose him. I mean, I didn't know at the time necessarily that he was going to be the one uh, who'd play RMF. Uh, but I guess soon after we wrote it, I I thought of him. Uh, mm-hmm. He was in Poor Things too, and he had a great time. We had a great time doing that and uh, the same here. So, yeah, it was just, you know, figuring out the structure, fi- figuring out the one character that wasn't going to be one of the main characters, but at the same time, he was kind of pivotal uh, in all three stories, uh, but he wouldn't appear so much in every story. Um, you know, the initials that were always part of the first story became uh, something recurring, recurring in the, mm-hmm. in the three stories. So it just made sense from a structural point of view to to use it that way and then you know he's he's just an incredible presence to have you know as the the man that appears you know in all three stories sure sweet dreams are made of this uh has become the uh anthem for this movie i I, i'll never forget the anticipation of being in that can audience we started clapping on beat during the opening credits because we were (laughs) so excited to watch the film uh, how did you settle on that song? Was uh, was there any kind of thematic connection to the lyrics, or was it just something that came to you? Uh, a bit of everything. I I decided relatively late uh, in the process to uh, to include a song in the beginning of the film, and which is the one that kind of uh, establishes RMF as you know the man in the car. Um, so I, I just started listening to music and I, you know, I took into consideration, you know, his age as well. Like he's from a different generation. I started li- listening to old music, old music that had affected me, uh, when I was younger and, you know, all these incredible iconic songs. And then of course, you know, you do listen to the lyrics as well. And that is important. So that you use something that is not, uh, you know, terribly um, inconsistent with, you know, what the film is. Uh, but at the same time, you w- you don't necessarily want something that's expositional or trying to explain anything about the film. So it just felt that it hits all the right, um, it hits the right balance uh, of everything that we wanted to achieve. And it's an, ac- an iconic song, of course, and very, you know, uh, you know, dear to me, as as in, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing millions of people that, you know, grew sure. up listening to it. Uh, and I and I have to ask, too, uh, who is your dog trainer? Because the way you've <laughs> utilized animals in various uh, films of, uh, that you've done over the years, have you always worked with the same people for that? Because there's one section in this movie where, it, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it was great. I loved what you did there with the dogs. Can you just tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, no, it was no, it was someone local. I guess you you have to work with people uh, in every uh, place that you go to because you have to source dogs as well. But mm-hmm. it was yeah, it was yeah, a very uh, intense experience. We actually kind of uh, shot most of it uh, as a pre shoot, just the the day before we started shooting yeah. the rest of the film. So. Uh, it felt like uh, the best way to start, you know, this film, like uh, filming all these dogs, doing all these strange things. Um, yeah, it was it was just great. I mean, they we came up with whatever it is that we wanted to do, and then he would go and uh, test it with the dogs. There was specific dogs that could do specific things. Certain dogs yeah. didn't like water. Certain lo- dogs didn't like beds. You know, there's the shower thing. Like it was just a a matter of casting the the right dog for each part. Right. Um, it was in the end, it was relatively straightforward. When we, you know, when he chose basically the the right dogs for for the parts and trained them to to do it, it was uh, relatively straightforward. When we were filming it, there was a couple of uh, scenes that needed a little of, bit of help with VFX because the dogs wouldn't do exactly. Yeah. What, uh was was necessary for the illusion uh but it was all shot you know uh practically uh and then some of it was put together and as i wrap up here um i want to ask before i go i'm just curious is there any one of the three stories that speaks most to you on a personal level 
Uh, not really, because, you know, it was, you know, a very careful selection of ideas that we had, myself and Ephthymis, and we always work in a way that we add to each other's ideas. So by the end of it, it just becomes very uh, personal for both of us, uh, whatever the story ends up becoming. So, yeah, I thought that, you know, they were all equally important to us and that's why we chose to include them uh, in one film otherwise we wouldn't we just keep trying to find you know another story that you know would feel the same that would feel that it has the same importance to us as the others well whether you're working with Ethimus or if you're working with Tony there's only one Yorgos Lanthimos and sir I can speak for everyone when I say we are so happy to have you doing what you do because nobody else is doing it like you. So thank you for this and thank you for your time here today. Thank you.